Good morning. Good morning. It is a great treat, a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for welcoming us. Uh, my name is Zach Anderson, and I'm here with my wife, Julie, and my two boys, Eli and Jasper. They're sitting in the back there. My wife, Julie, and I have had the privilege of being on staff with the mission organization Crew, or Campus Crusade for Christ, for over 20 years. Most of that time was overseas in Eastern Europe and in East Asia. And when we were overseas, we primarily worked with high school students and college students. But recently, we've been involved with the Jesus Film Ministry of Crew. And it's possible that some of you have heard about this ministry. This is a, a film that's been around for over 40 years, and it's been translated into more languages than any other motion picture. But often, it's been shown in very primitive, distant places in the world. And so you hear these stories that are passed down certain experiences that people have had when they've seen this film show that God works in very unique ways. Many times they would put up a giant screen in a village and the villagers would come and they could sit on either side of the screen because of the way it was projected. They could see it on both sides. But for many of these people, this was the first time they had ever actually seen a motion picture. And one of these screenings, there was a man who, as he was watching the soldiers beat Jesus, he became so frustrated, he took a spear and he threw it at the screen to try to get them to stop. But it's no wonder that this film has, for, as I said, over 40 years, done incredible things. And many times, God uses it in ways that doesn't even involve people like me. Just a few years ago, there was a celebration in the country of Iran. And at this celebration, the way it would work was they would light these giant bonfires, and young men would run toward those bonfires and leap through the flames to sort of celebrate this national holiday. And there was a young father who was filming this with his video camera, and you can see on the film this young father's young son, after seeing this happen, he runs toward the fire to see if he can do it as well, but he didn't realize that he had been splashed with gasoline. And when he jumped into the air, you can see he explodes like a human torch. People run from all directions with blankets and quickly put out the fire, and they put the boy onto a truck and brought him to the hospital. And when the doctor examined him, he said, he's not burned. The father brought him home, and when they arrived home, the father said to his son, we have to find those people who came with the blankets and thank them. And his son said, they didn't do it, father. It was the man, the man with the bird on his shoulder. His father didn't understand what he was talking about. But just a couple days later, in their living room, they were watching a satellite broadcast of the Jesus film. And in the scene when the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes down to land on Jesus' shoulder, the boy looked at the screen, pointed, and said to his father, he's the one, Father. He's the one who touched my face that day. God doesn't even really need to use me at all. He's already doing things in the world. So when I find that he allows me to be involved in his work, I just count it a tremendous privilege. The ministry that I'm in particular involved with involves taking short films, many times just two, three, four, five minute long films, and putting them online so that they can be shared in 12 particular countries of the world where it is not easy for the gospel to be shared one-on-one. -on -one. In some cases, it's illegal. And so people often find the best avenue for hearing about the gospel is either online or when having a friend send them a film, one phone to another. And these are the short films that I'm involved with creating with another few groups of people. Uh, if you'd be interested in finding out more about our ministry, I've put some of our newsletters in the back table in the foyer there. And if you'd like to receive our newsletters, you can sign up and we'd be happy to add you to our list. I just have to tell you, we, we, we find it to be such a joy when we know people pray for our ministry. And so if you know that you're a praying person, we would love you to receive our newsletter and to pray for us and offer us that kind of support. We feel like people who pray for us 
are on the field with us just as though they were there in person. So thank you so much for letting me be here today. Uh, we'd love to talk with you afterward, and uh, I'll give the word back to Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Julie, and uh, for being being here today. And thank you for that that story. You know that story of the boy in Iran is going to stick with me for a long time. Um, but also your words of encouragement to us is, you know, what can we do? Sometimes we we find ourselves in a place like Grove City, wondering what kind of an impact can we have on those that are that are called into the to the field of ministry across across the seas, and, and you're exactly right that the power of prayer and the power of our God and the blessing that it is when we do have the opportunity to join him where he's already at work. So we pray a blessing over your continuing ministry, uh, and again, thank you for being here this morning. Okay, I'm going to start this morning a little bit different with an oral exam. And so what that means is I'm going to expect responses. So verbal responses, okay? Otherwise you can't pass the test and, and leave this room this morning, okay? So here's how the game is or this action or activity is going to work. I'm going to give you some kind of an action, and I want you to tell me what part of the person, what part of the body is connected with that action. Okay, so for example, I might say seeing... And you would say, eyes. eyes, right? Good, look at this. You guys are easily trainable here. Okay, so next. Tasting. Tongue. Okay, tongue or mouth. Yep, how about smelling? Nose. Nose, okay. What about walking? Legs. Legs, feet. Okay, what about thinking? Brain. Okay, your brain, your mind. What about feeling? Okay, what about feeling guilty? Conscience. Your conscience, your heart, okay. What about hearing? Ears. Your ears, okay. So that would likely, expectedly be your first response. But I want to suggest to you this morning that the heart would be an even better answer for what we hear through. So I'm going to begin this morning as I often do with my sermon, although it's a change today, I couldn't narrow it down to one sentence, so it's a sermon in a paragraph. So if I'm here long enough, you'll get a sermon in an essay or something so that you'll really have a hard time remembering it. But So this sermon in a paragraph is intended to be a summary of what you are going to hear uh, that you can take with you and share with those who may wonder what you did on your weekend or what you heard about at your Sunday service. And so here is my sermon today in a paragraph form. The key to living out our faith is not to just hear the word, but to humbly receive it and allow it to reshape our thinking so we will do as it says. To hear the word and not do it is to really not hear the word at all. God's word is intended to change us, not entertain us. It's not just for our consumption, it's for our construction. Our focus this morning will be on 2 Samuel. Now it's important to note that in the original Hebrew, 1 and 2 Samuel were really one book. So throughout our readings, we have been reminded in the past, we've been reminded about God's call on his people. We talked about this a couple times, it's been probably a month or so ago before we focused on, or since we focused on it, but that God called his people to be set apart, to be holy. They are not to be like the other nations. They are to serve one true, the one true God, Yahweh. He has called them to be different. And yet in 1 Samuel, so we'll start there this morning, we found that the Israelites demanded a king. Why did they demand this king? Well, the scripture is clear. They wanted to be like every other nation around them. So even when God tells them what hardship they are about to face, 
by demanding a king, they cry out even more for a king. Now, as you read through the book of 1 Samuel, and the reason I'm partly going back to this is, yes, it leads into today, but also partly because, as you note, last Sunday I didn't preach from our text. We took a little uh, segue away for Easter. But as they call for this king that is that uh, they demand, Saul has been rejected because of his failure to respond to God's leadership. So Saul was put in place by God, but we saw, again, I'm fast-forwarding quickly through this, but as you read, Saul lost his place of leadership as a result of his disobedience to God. So in place of Saul, God placed J, uh, placed David. And we he's described in 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 14 in a very familiar passage. David, that is, as a man after God's own heart. But instead of being repentant for his sins, Saul rages in bitterness. And he makes it his goal to kill David because he wants to eliminate his threat to the throne. And so for the most of most of the second half of first Samuel we read about David fleeing from Saul and he runs to the southern deserts runs and hides in the southern deserts in Israel. But now we're going to actually turn to some scripture today, first Samuel chapter 28. This isn't where we're going to stay, but this is kind of the lead up into our focus this morning. So we read this in verse 1 in 1 Samuel 28. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to war, to fight against Israel. So this is the beginning of the section. So that one verse, they're getting ready, they're preparing for war against Israel. So this is leading into what we're going to focus on here in just a minute. But this looming battle with the Philistines has Saul scared. He's worried about what's going to happen. So he does something that he was commanded not to do. He goes to see a medium or a soothsayer. And so he asks this medium to give him guidance about what to do. And he receives it in the form of the spirit of Samuel, who had died a few chapters earlier. So here's what he received in verses, this is skip forward to verse 16 in 1 Samuel 28. It says, this is Samuel's response. He said, why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom from you, and has given it to your neighbor, David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will be the Lord will give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Now at this same moment in time, David is hanging out, hiding in the south. Skip ahead a couple chapters to chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. So we find where David is at. It says, Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went on their way. Now skip ahead. Fifteen more verses to verse 17. Chapter 30. David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except four hundred young men, who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his wives. Okay, remember, this is all lead up to where we're going still, so stick with me here a minute. Go to chapter 31. So we discover in chapter 31, the battle is now taking place. 
Again, picking it up in chapter 31, verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him. And he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor base, I'm sorry, his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But the armor bearer wouldn't do it, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day. We see the fulfillment of the words that God gave to Saul just a couple chapters before. But take note, this is what's going to say, is is what happened to Saul, how he died. Remember that the armor bearer refused to do so? You maybe are wondering why he did. We'll get to that in a little bit. But then Saul chose to fall upon his own sword. So keep that in mind as we go forward. So notice here, one thing that's also important is David is not responsible at all for Saul's death. Not only is he a hundred miles away to the south, but again, as I emphasize, Saul actually took his own life because of fear in the midst of the battle. So now that brings us to the actual focus of our message, and that's in 2 Samuel. So flip forward, if you would, or the text is on the screen as it always is, to chapter 1. And we read, After the death of Saul, when David had returned from striking down the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, a man came to him from Saul's camp, with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And he came to David, he fell on the ground and paid homage. And David said to him, Where did you come from? And he said, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said, How did it go? Tell me. And the man answered, The people fled from the battle, and also many have fallen and are dead. And Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. Then David said to the young man who told them, told him, How do you know that Saul and his son are dead? And the young man said, By chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa. And there was Saul leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and the horsemen were coming upon him. And then he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called to me. And I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? I answered, I am an Amalekite. And he said, Stand beside me and kill me. For anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood behind him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, and I have brought them here to my Lord. Now right away, we notice there's something wrong here. There's a problem, and maybe you picked up on it as well. We see that Saul's death in chapter 31 said that he fell on the spear and killed himself. Now there's something fishy about this man's story. But David doesn't really know what happened. At this point, he's kind of, you know, he's the innocent bystander who doesn't know the circumstances of the battle. He's just trying to learn what happened. So all he knows at this point is the, the, the version that was relayed to him by this man. Now look at how David responds when he hears the word. Remember, he spent a good portion of his life fleeing from this man who has just died. We read that David took his own, took hold of his clothes and tore them, and fasted until evening for Saul and Jonathan and his, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Even though these men were outcasts, David was considered an outcast. 
even though he'd been living in a sense at that time as a fugitive, he was branded as a traitor, he couldn't help but grieve for his fallen king, for the fallen prince and his fallen countrymen. But the story doesn't end there. Look in verse, or chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, verses 13 through 16. David is still speaking to this young Amalekite. And he says, where did you come from? And the Amalekite answered, I am the son of a sojourner, an Amalekite. David said to him, how was it that you were not afraid to put your hand Put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. Then David called one of the young men and said, Go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Notice how this man answers David's question about his identity. He first tells him that he is a son of a sojourner. That means he's a resident alien who has grown up among the people of Israel. But he also identifies himself, secondly, as an Amalekite. Now, what you may or may not know, maybe what you came across as you've read through the scriptures this year, is that the Amalekites were no friends of the Israelites. In fact, shortly before this story, David had saved his people from a raiding party of Amalekites. In fact, if you think even further back to when Egypt, uh, when, they, when uh, Moses rescued them from Egypt, who was, it that res- who, who was it that attacked the rear of their camp? It was the Amalekites. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 15, God calls the people to remember how Amalek attacked them when they were faint and weary. They cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind, and they did not fear God. And this was why, if you remember it through your reading, Saul was commanded to wipe out the Amalekites, to carry out God's judgment. But Saul didn't listen, and thus he was judged himself. So given what we know about this group of people, the Amalekites, this man's motive, the fact that they did not like the Jewish or the Israelite people, his motives are immediately suspicious. Because we know how Saul actually died, we can conclude that this man was a greedy scavenger who, was, who found the king's body, or the dead king's body, and took the crown and the armlet. He then concocted this story to make himself appear heroic in order to win the new king's favor and maybe even earn some kind of a new or some kind of a reward from the new king as i've said this amalekite lived among the israelites he should have known much better than to concoct a story like this remember david had the chance to kill saul twice but he wouldn't do it Saul's armor bearer wouldn't kill him, even to protect, you know, even when he was asked by Saul to do so. David told one of his men back earlier on, when David, if you remember, he was hiding in a cave, and Saul was outside the cave, and they were hunting for David, and David, it says, he came in and they, he cut off an edge of his cloak. So he had the opportunity to end Saul's life that day. But he told them this, Do not destroy him, speaking about Saul, for for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be counted as guiltless? So even though the story that this man brings is a false story, this Amalekite comes with a contrived fake story, There are serious consequences for this deception. But look how God used David to bring judgment against this man. He has confessed to killing God's anointed king. 
And he dies because of that very confession. Now, as we think about this story, one of the questions I'd encourage you to ask yourself is this. How would you expect David to receive this message? Or maybe I should ask it this way. If you were David and you learned that Saul, the very man who was, in a lot of ways, was your enemy, he had forced you to do some um, things that you didn't want to do in your life, how would you have received this message of his dying? Now remember, even years prior to this, David had already been anointed the future king. But he was not exalted in a royal robe. Instead, he was exiled into the wilderness, and he was clothed with shame. Even though David had been the hero who had gone and slain the Philistine giant, and he had led the Israel people, the Israelite people, to victory time and time again, he was no longer celebrated as a hero. Remember the jealousy that rose up in Saul as the women paraded by, saying, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. So there was a deep jealousy on Saul's behalf. Time and time again, the man who should have been the hero was sought out and hunted for. The man who once fought the enemies of Israel was now labeled the enemy of Israel. And his comrades were now seeking to take his life. He'd been given the king's daughter at one point for a wife, but then he was driven from his home. His wife was given to another man in marriage. So instead of going to meet with the Philistines as an equal, as a royal equal, as a, as a king would with another, he has to meet with them as an asylum and as an enemy. You remember this? Did you catch the story where he's, he's in, in their country and they, somebody recognizes him and says, isn't this David? So how did David respond? I do it, but you might think I'm a little crazy here. He, he started to act like a madman. He started doing things for the purpose that they would think they, they wouldn't do the worst to him. He didn't get a kingly bed, only dirt and rocks to lay his head. He didn't have a royal court, only a band of outcasts and misfits. No royal procession, only hiding in caves. And all of it with no end in sight. Can you imagine this? Have you lived like this? And who was to blame? Only one man. Saul. So how would you receive the news of Saul's death? Now anyone would mourn for Jonathan. You know, he was a beloved brother. He was faithful. And, and, and who among us wouldn't mourn over a defeat within our nation? As I reread through this, I thought about you know, a time that was impactful in my uh, early adulthood was 9-11. And the mourning that took place for the people of this nation. But wouldn't you be tempted to at least kind of grieve, you know, maybe it's, you go into your, you know, you, you mourn publicly, and then you go off into your office or into your bedroom, and you kind of, ah, thank you, thank you for taking Saul out of my life. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Or better yet, maybe you'd be tempted to celebrate the end of your exile. I can come home now. The threat on my life is over. But still, after all this time, after losing so much, i got to believe that many of us would want to rejoice at the thought of a wicked and murderous man like Saul finally feeling the deadly blow of justice. Wouldn't you maybe even go as far as honoring the man who took his life? Thanking him for removing him from the picture 
After all, as I've already said, he tried over and over and over again to kill David. Perhaps, given the position that David was about to come into, he would rightly offer him some reward. He would give him maybe a, a position of authority for what he had done. In fact, he even brought you the crown. He's helped you out. He's given, you don't have to go find this stuff or get it from someone else. He's brought it to you. But what we read is how David responded. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Which of us would not, after suffering this way, would be tempted to do what I just said? How many of you wouldn't even call them temptations? You would say, this is a justifiable response. After all that he did to me, I deserve to do this. It's my right. But that isn't David. Like all of us, David received this message through his ears, but also he heard the news with his heart. And what do we know? What did we say about the kind of heart that David possessed? As I said earlier, he was a man after God's own heart. So I think it's fair to say, we can say that David had a godly heart. A God-centered heart. A God-informed heart. A heart that exalted God above all else. In fact, we read later on that God told Samuel, when Samuel first went to find this new king, remember, he doesn't, he doesn't think much, he doesn't think anything at all of David. But God said to David, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And so what we see here is how David responded. He didn't, respi he didn't respond with an eye for his glory, but God's glory. Not with an eye towards his own desires, but God's agenda. Not with an eye towards his rights, but God's righteousness. God's priorities. God's love for his people. Now, every day, you know, it's only 1054. And uh, I can dare say that you have all received some kind of news today in some form. I don't know what that news is, uh, but it was maybe it was an urgent call from a friend. Or maybe you received, you know, maybe you received a report from a... Uh, you know, this doesn't really work well on a Sunday, but maybe you received a report from a doctor. Those things happen on a regular basis. Maybe you opened up your email this morning and received a response from someone. Or a post on Facebook that was directed, or social media that was directed to you. Maybe you got a report from the newscaster this morning if you turned on the news. Maybe you got some gossip from your neighbor. Or maybe you heard news from a grown-up child who was calling to just check in and see how you're doing. And don't you, when you hear this message, these messages, don't you hear them in your heart as well? And so I have to ask you, as I have asked myself many times, what does your response to these messages that come reveal about your heart? David's heart was filled with grief and righteous zeal because his focus was on the good of others and the glory of God. <clears throat> How often are we filled with fear or anger or jealousy or bitterness or lust or pride because our focus is on our own good and our own glory? And when that happens... <clears throat> Our response is anything but righteous. If we're honest with ourselves, just like the Amalekite, aren't we often looking to do uh, things to advance our own good? We, we do anything to shape a story that's going to make us come out ahead in some way. We may even make up a story to advance our agenda. And just like the Amalekite, when we do this, we will feel the deadly blow of justice. 
But not only should this passage convict us, it should also comfort us. Because the king of Israel here is presented as, our only, as their only hope. And he was a hope to those who honored the king. But we have the ultimate king that we celebrated again. We remembered all that he did last Sunday on Calvary. Did David honor God well? Yes. Did he do it perfectly? No, he didn't. And as a result of those failures, the people suffered some different circumstances. But nonetheless, God promised David an eternal kingdom. And God fulfilled that promise by sending his eternal king, Jesus. Now as we prepare to close, listen to these words from Acts chapter 13, verses 36 through 39. We read about David. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom David raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Only in Jesus can we be set free from the kind of heart that we might have anticipated David would have in this situation. Do you understand that? Our hearts are often so calloused over and angry and bitter by the things that life, as, as we might say, the things that life has given us. And we miss the true message of the cross. That God, through Jesus, he's given you the freedom of your sins through belief. Brothers and sisters, you know, we are all at different places in our journey. But it has been a great joy to watch how God is working in your hearts. But regardless of how far you are, or how far I am, our hearts continually need to be changed. And Jesus alone can do that. So that day that David heard the news of Saul's death, the Amalekite ran with, with energy, but a heart full of greed and deception. But in doing the opposite, may we run towards God's anointed king with humility and honesty. And so that when we receive all that Jesus died for, we can begin to hear his word, his truth, with a different heart. And your responses begin to change. And so my advice to you when you leave this place, in any situation you find yourself, is to run. Run to Jesus. And so we are reminded today that the key to living out our faith is not to just hear the word, but to humbly receive it and allow it to reshape our thinking. So that we will do as it says. To hear the word, I want to emphasize this part here. To hear the word and not do it is to not hear it at all. God's word is intended to change us, not entertain us. It's not just for our consumption, it's for our construction. And I want to remind you, the last thing I'm going to say before we pray is this. A couple weeks ago I mentioned that Sunday morning for me is the end, in a sense, of my work week, if you will. The culmination of the study that I have done is what you receive. Now is your time to begin. The word has been given, and as the Bereans did so faithfully, now is your time to dig back into the word and see what God is continuing to teach. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for uh, your word. I think specifically today about the examples that you have given us, Lord. We, I thank you for the example of David, for a man, as you said yourself, was a man after your heart. Lord, we can hear those words and think, how can that 
How can that mean anything to me? How can I be a man after God's own heart? Look at all of the things that David did for your glory. And yet, we are reminded of the fact that David, like any other person that we read in Scripture, had his faults. He too was a fallen human being. Yet, Lord, what I want our focus to be on from today was how David responded to the loss of something that, from a human standpoint, was doing nothing but to stand in his way for the life that God had called him to. Lord, often there are things, circumstances, maybe even people that we see that are standing in our path. Lord, we may find ourselves even wishing that they could be removed in some form so that our path may be made clear. And yet, Lord, I would pray that we would have a heart that would mourn for uh, these individuals, for their maybe not recognizing who you are, to be grieved by the fact that they do not serve you. Lord, I think about one of my favorite lines in a song, asking that we be given your eyes, so that we may see the world as you do. We ask for forgiveness in the many, many circumstances on a daily basis where we look around us and we judge by the outside appearance. Lord, teach us to become people who see people through the heart. Lord, teach us to hear, not just with our ears, but with our hearts. To have compassion on one another, to love one another, to, to understand what others are going through. To show care and concern to be able to help one another, to encourage one another to be who you have called us to be, the very body of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and we will have one closing song. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace this day and forevermore. And remember, church, as I've been reminding you, every Sunday you are sent. Go and be ministers for Christ.